You can have a seat. What's up? What's up? What's up? <clears throat> I was going to uh, I was going to jump into what I was going to preach about, but as the as the uh, time was quickly approaching, I know what I'm about to say, and you don't. And uh, I realized that more and more and more, oh, I know what I'm about to say is is um, much like you know Jesus had a hard message. And the people are like, man, who can receive that, you know? And he says, uh, are you going to leave me too? Because he has a hard message. And, uh, and I believe that the Lord has a hard message uh, for you tonight. And for the next at least three weeks. And Lord willing, the next three decades, a hard message. A challenging message, one that would rattle the status quo in your life, in mine, in the life of our church, in the life of our community, and maybe who knows what the Lord would have for our church, right? So that being said, I think that the only way to really start this thing out is not jump right into it because, you know, when you jump into a hot tub, if it's super, super hot, that hurts. So what do you do? You just kind of ease in, right? And I think the way to ease in is, is to just pray and, and, and let God get your heart ready, get your ears ready to receive. And uh, we've been talking about on Wednesday night that when we get up and we preach, that we should be thinking about what we can obey, not what we can hear, not what we can like, not what we can dislike, but what can I obey, God? What can I obey from your word that would please you and bring blessing to my life? And so, Father, I would ask that you would um, you do that work in us. I don't, I don't uh, dare say that I understand the Trinity in its entirety at all. I am just a weak man. But it's my understanding that it's the Holy Spirit of God that does this work to help us to understand, to lead us into all truth, to bring to us a place of conviction. And so I pray that your spirit would come and and do that work in us now. I personally give you permission to invade my space. You said that you want to change who we are by changing the way we think. And we need some deep surgery in our church. And to that, I ask that you would come and do just that. Cut deep. Cut deep. And cure us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, listen. uh, So, we're starting a new series here, right? It's called I Choose. People don't like to hear that. I know from now almost 15 years of standing up here, I know that when you start talking about that, people don't like to hear it. I, I, I decided to uh, name this message series I Choose for a certain reason. I'll get to that in just a minute. But I, as I was putting it all together, I was kind of thinking, like, what, what's the name of this thing? What's the name of this thing? And so I, kinda, I almost named it um, Inside the Pastor's Mind. Inside the pastor's mind. And I don't mean just mine. I mean that every single month I meet with pastors. And it wasn't just here in Leesburg, but it's been over in Eustis and stuff too when, I used to, when we used to be over there. And I meet with pastors and every single month we hear the same thing in the group. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's a church of 800 or a church of 80. It's always the same thing. And we tell each other stuff all the time. You know, the stuff we won't tell you? Because you tick me off, and I tick you off, and I'm disappointed, and I wish it could be this way, and it's not, and it doesn't make any difference what the pastor is. I'm telling you, I know people that have churches with a 1,000 people that say the same exact thing that I say. And the problem is, is that the stuff that we say to each other in our little Vegas, you know what I'm talking about, right? The problem is, is we don't need to speak it to the other pastors. The people who need to hear it aren't listening. The people who need to hear it aren't present. And they never hear it, and because they never hear it, status quo. 
It never changes. And I know guys have been doing this for 30 years, still saying the same thing. And I'm like, man, something's not right. So here's the deal. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that he was going to build his church. Right? That's what he said. He said he's going to build his church. So would you agree he's going to? Everyone? Okay, awesome. And he is. Across the world, it's growing. China, Africa, India. One of the big places where it's growing like crazy is Egypt, right? Egypt, think about it. In all places, the place, you know, Pharaoh and the Red Sea and all that stuff, they should hate God. It's exploding over there. But here in America, it's dying. It's dying. You know, the, 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 listen, thousands of churches every year close the doors. And that doesn't mean they move down the road. Done. I quit. I can't take this anymore. No one comes. No one helps. No one hears. No one's here. I'm out of here. Sell it and turn it into a bar. Sell it and turn it into a coffee house. Sell it and turn it into a liquor store. It happens all the time, doesn't it? What's wrong? In, in, in this country where, where it was formed so that we could worship him? That's the reason why, right? So we could worship him freely. That's one of the two main reasons why we started this nation, was to worship Christ. And in this fertile ground, it's plummeting year after year after year. I saw a, a stat, I, we put it on our Facebook page. You know, 70% of our country says that they're Christian. They self-identify as Christians. Do you know this, right? 70%. I don't know what the number really is, but it's 70%. But yet only 25% of those people actually ever go to church. Do you ever wonder why the, 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 the moral climate of the country is plummeting? Is it those darn Democrats? Is it those, those, those wretched Republicans? It's not. The reason why it's plummeting into a sewer is because the institution that God has ordained to be the salt of the earth and the light to the world is pathetically weak. That's why. A nation's downfall is moral rot. That's what the scriptures say. Right? It's, not the, it's not the Democrats because they want, listen, I'm going to be bold. It's not because they say it's okay to have an abortion. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans because they want the rich people to get richer. It's the church. It's the, they weren't, the government's not designed for that stuff. It's to balance budgets and defend the borders, not to push morality, not to push back darkness. That's what we're for. Okay? And, and this is how it works. This is not just something I made up. The way that Jesus Christ builds his church, think of a building in your mind. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Second floor, third floor, fourth floor, fifth floor. The, the way that it gets there is on the bricks on the bottom, right? Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, right? And then we are living stones that he's putting in place to build his church on. You can't have a second, third, fourth, fifth story, something bigger, more powerful, making a bigger imprint on the world around us. That big building, if the stones at the bottom are cracking and breaking and they're not there sometimes. What can you put on that? So the message is to those who are already Christians that are sitting here right now. And again, tomorrow morning. Everyone who's in the church already, who's bent the knee to Jesus and was called to this church, if you want this church to be a force to reckon with, the, the, the salt of the earth, the light on the city on a hill for the city of Leesburg and Tiberias, like, it, it depends on you. It depends on you. He can't build on something that's not there. In the book of Acts, we see it. The greatest time of victory in the history of the church. What does it say? 3,000 people got added the first day. And then every day after that, it said people were getting saved every day. 
We have to come up with good programs and, and great singing groups and, 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 and whatever to, to beg people to come. Please come. Those people didn't do that. All the people, all of them. Who's all? Raise your hand if you're in the all. All, every one of them were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship that's gathering together for a common cause, for prayer and breaking bread. All of them devoted, listen, every day. Every day they gathered in here, and then when they got done, what did they do? Every day. They went to someone's homes. Let me ask you a question. Did they have kids? Did they have jobs? Did they have a car to get somewhere? No. But yet somehow, some way, it was a priority to build Christ's church. And God honored that, and 3,000 people got saved that first day. And then every day. And what we settle for, I know I have, is to say, well, more people get saved here than in most churches. Our, baptism, our, our water, our, our tank is, is wet and full more often than most. No, that's playing church. All the people, all the time, all in. That's a church. Anything short of that, listen, honestly, is Moses giving a speech. And Meredith babysitting your children. That's not a church. No, a church is when all the people who are called there roll up their sleeves and get involved with Christ building his church. Can someone say amen? Okay. Not just in word, but in deed. And that's what has to happen. We, we, need, we need for this thing to work. No longer do we need to get up and hint and beat around the bush. Okay? We can't do that. And I've been a bold guy my whole ministry, but I'm not that guy anymore. That guy's gone. This new guy is way more bold because he's not going to hold back anymore. Because sometimes when your children, and I don't, I'm not condescending because most of you, some of you are older than me, so I don't want to say that, but as a spiritual child, right, it's much like a physical child. When your child is sick, do they want to take NyQuil? But what do you have to do sometimes to get them to eat the NyQuil? I love you, Paul. <laughs> Open up your mouth. What happens when your dog won't take medicine? You shove them, open up their mouth and shove it down. And it's not because you're being mean. It's because you love them. Here's what I'm talking about. All of us get involved. All of us participate in Christ building his church. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. So let me ask you a question. How many people in this church, show of hands, have ever volunteered in a church or are presently volunteering in this one right now? Raise your hand. Hold on a second. Let me see. Every single person. That's awesome. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Now, since we brought the kids up, we'll use that as an example. Let's say that you have volunteered to share the gospel like Meredith was talking about, share the good news with the kids. You're on the schedule. You got the schedule. You're on the schedule. This is going to hurt, guys. You're on the schedule. You got it a month or two ago, and then the day before the service, or well, that afternoon, something comes up. Oh, my sister is in a car wreck. Oh, my aunt Sophie flew into town. She doesn't want to go to church. We got to pick her up at the airport. I'm not feeling well. My kid has soccer. I mean, what, just anything, 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 anything. So what's happened in the past is that we have, um, I know my, like my wife, she said, hey, 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 you know, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I got it. I'll cover for you. Because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what's expected of ministers now. And what I say is that she just created one more step down into a culture of lack of commitment. But what happens if you called up 
and you said, um, you know, Pastor, I was supposed to, you know, teach the children tomorrow night. Um, but yeah, my sister was in a car wreck, and I, she passed. And I said, that doesn't matter. You need to show up and go teach those kids. Show of hands, honestly, how many people would be back to this church? Well, I just quoted Jesus directly from the Bible. And that's the problem with the church in America. Because Jesus was approached by a man, said, come follow me. And the man said, I will, but let me go bury my father who died. He said, no, let the dead bury the dead. Your duty is to preach the kingdom. And then the next person came and said, I'll follow you, but let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And he said, no, when I called you, I called you to follow me now. If you put your hand to the plow and turn back, you're not worthy of my kingdom. And the problem in the church is that I can't quote Jesus or I'm shunned. And listen, that sets a high, high bar. And when you set a high bar, some people won't get saved. And I say shame on them. But if I set a low one and they think they're saved, shame on me. And I'm never doing it again for the rest of my life. I will never back down from biblical truth again for the rest of my life. And that's a promise to you. And if you don't like it, I love you. I love you. But I want you to genuinely know Christ. Not some Christ that you've made up in your mind or the way you think or feel it's right. Listen, the Bible is true. And at some point, a Christ follower has to take their feelings and set them aside and say, God's truth is, outweighs my feelings. And so, listen, no more. If we're going to be an awesome church that really honestly makes a dent in hell, if, if we're going to live out the reason why God provided for this insane, amazing place when none of us who have been here had any money, and here it is, 10,000 square feet in the middle of the heaviest commerce area where there's no church and provided all this stuff, why did he do that except to make a massive dent in hell? But the only way that that's going to work, right, is if the, the, the bricks just above the foundation are solid. They don't just show up when they want. When it's convenient, oh, I'll see what I can do. I had to listen. I was here the other day. There's a young man that comes to this church often. And man, this crushed me. Is it OK to be honest with you guys, right? It's good, right? He was, here and he was here on Wednesday, and he said, hey, what do you guys got going on here on Wednesday night, right? You got, don't you have something? I said, yeah, man, we have our potluck dinner at 6 o'clock, and then we go in here, and we're doing this study through the scriptures to find out what, you know, vertical church, to find out what, what God wants in his church. He goes, oh, man, if I got nothing else going on, I'll come by. That's common, man. It broke my heart, but it's all the time. It's all the time. And we want our church to be awesome. We want our church to grow. We want our church to impact our community. We want our church to, listen, we should be thinking nationwide. We should be talking about to the ends of the earth. That's what it says, right? That's what we should be thinking. How does that happen? How does that happen unless the bricks in the foundation are solid, right? All the time. And so I just want to preach that way. I don't want to hide anything. I don't want to... Like when Jesus, listen, the rich guy that came to Jesus, he said, what do I got to do for, for, for eternal life? What did he say? Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, right? Oh, and by the way, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. What did the guy do? See ya. And what did Jesus do? Did he go running after him? Oh, let me tone it back a little bit. You don't have to give up all of it. Just show up when you can. He never did that. He was willing to let them go. Willing to let them go. Because to be saved, it's based on truth, right? Not on some made-up, low-standard gospel that keeps people coming. I don't want to look Jesus in the eye one day and have to answer for that. I'd rather answer to you than answer to him, I promise you. So I want to preach that way from now on. See, there was a... 
you know, the church is plummeting, right, all over the, all over the country. Church, and and it's, it's deceiving because we can go on our phones or online and we can see these churches. You know, you see Joel Osteen's church, you think, well, Christianity's live and well. Look at all these people. Look at Stephen Furtick's place. Look at Matt Chandler's place. Look at all these guys. Look at John Piper's place and John MacArthur and all, all these. Look at Bethel. It's all filled with people. It's good. And that's, those are anomalies, man. You know what most churches are? You're sitting in one. The average church in America is what? 75 people. So between tonight and tomorrow, that's where we, we usually run, 75 to 100 people. That's where we are. Why? If Jesus Christ is building his church and you know he's going to without fail, why aren't churches growing? Is it because of him? Who's it because of? Raise your hand. It's not because of the lost. They don't know any better. It's because the people who... The pe- <laughs> I, was listening to a, I was listening to a preacher the other day. And he was up in the Himalayas on a mission trip. The most beautiful place on earth, right? He said, these mountains for the last 2,000 years, the people that are living up in these remote villages, they've been surrounded by these mountains. These mountains have been screaming the existence of God. But yet never once have they proclaimed the name of Jesus. That's our privilege and we don't use it. And churches remain empty and decline and decline all the time. I don't want that anymore. I'm tired of barely, listen, this, we're in this together. I'm tired of barely paying the rent here. This is nothing, it's not about me, but you know, there's months I don't get paid because it's just still floundering. This, this day after day of people coming and our great need in this community that God placed us in, right? To help. Like, isn't that what the church is supposed to do? Push back darkness, right? People come all the time. I need help. I need help. I'm like, I can't help you. I can't help you. Because our church doesn't have to give. I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking you to bleed your account. That's not what I'm standing there for. All of us give according to the Spirit leading us. But more people, more giving, more serving. It's the most important thing in your life. And we have to get a a, we have to grab hold of that. That's what a real Christian is. And anything short of that, I don't know that that's a Christian. And and I don't, I'm not here to to blitz or, or hurt. I'm just saying that the scriptures that outline our faith tell us what a Christian is and what God wants for your life. And if you won't do it, it'll never grow. And people will die and be separated from God forever because you didn't engage. Why did he say, let the dead bury the dead? Is it because we shouldn't honor our father that passed? Of course we should. What he's saying here is that the people who are dead aren't as important as the people who are alive. He's dead. He's your dad. I get it. But he's dead. And there's people over here that you may not even know, and to you that's not as important. But if you don't say something to them, they're going to pass just like him without Christ. What's more important? We got our values so jacked up, we don't know what to do. And so I want to I wanna point out the cancers that are in the church as the scriptures would speak. And I want to find the cure here as well and unashamedly share it with you in hopes, and I've prayed and I can't make you do anything, but you can choose to do something different. Because we're a church that was established to bust out of the status quo, right? That's our name. And that's what we need to do. We can't, listen, no matter what size the church is, 10% of the people do 100% of the work. I was talking to, to um, some of you know John and Mia from One Fire, right? Love John. Him and his wife, they're, 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 they're part of the one church in Lake Mary. It's like 800 people that go there, right? She's been watching kids now in Sunday school for years. She said, we still don't have enough people to watch the kids. 
Man, 800 people? You don't have enough people still? No, because there's more kids. We have a coffee house out here. It's our outreach. We got like four people working it. Four people out of almost 100. And just being honest, right? I mean, it might offend you, but I don't want to offend you. I don't want to offend you. This can, and I'm okay with that. But why? Why out of 100 people, we only have four who would say, I'll give my time to reach the lost? Why? How far have we fallen? And so I want to encourage you, please, take this as a, as, a, as a loving correction as we jump into this series, okay? All right? All right. Um, this is a big thing. This is a big thing, this thing, this idea of choosing. I, I've, been, uh, I've heard it said, I don't know who it was, that life is 10% what happens and 90% of how you respond to it. Now, I don't know if that would you know, hold up you know, against scientific scrutiny. You know, I don't know. I don't know if those numbers shift and change on the situation or the person. Um, but I think it makes sense. I think it does. I mean, and when I mean stuff, you know, stuff happening, um, I mean stuff that you didn't decide to do. And you didn't ask you didn't invite that into your life. It just kind of came into your life, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, I, I'm talking like there's seven, you know, there's seven billion people in this world, right? Seven billion people, everyone's doing something every day. We're doing stuff all the time. And so seven billion people doing stuff outside of your influence that could do things that could influence your life, right? People all around you. And then there's other outside stuff, you know, like um, an act of God. Like, it rains. Who, who, is that your fault if it rains? It, I mean, how about the economy? It's like a, it's a worldwide web of different countries and billions of people buying and selling and producing and lowering and heightening, you know, whatever, sales, prices, and commodities and all these things. And, and who, is, that your, is that up to you? No, not at all. Governments make rules. That's not up to you. Taxes come out, and infections set in. It's stuff, right? Stuff happens to us every single day. It's called life. And from the moment you wake up in the morning to the sound of your alarm, to that last moment when you lay your head down on the pillow to close your eyes, stuff happens and nobody is exempt from this it's not a christian thing it's an everybody thing from, from, from the guy who's living off the grid in 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 alaska somewhere in some little uh, homemade hot that he's made to to the lady in suburbia somewhere decorating her she shed everybody has stuff going on in their life right but it's how you respond to that stuff that defines who you are. Everybody gets sick. Everybody is tempted. Everyone experiences loss. Everyone is subject to the government. And everyone gets to choose their response to these things. I was there the day that, Mr. I've said this before, the day that Mr. Gregg, who's passed on, I was there the day in the hospital several years ago when we were in the emergency room. He had this nagging cough that wouldn't go away. And I was with him in the emergency room, and after they did the testing, the doctor came in and said, Mr. Williams, I have bad news. You have cancer. Now, listen, I can sit in that room, and Bethany can sit in that room, and that doctor can come to both of us and say, Moses, you have cancer. Bethany, you have cancer. Because we could all get it, right? But how we choose to respond to that is going to set the trajectory of our life. And I was there the day that Mr. Greg got the news of the big C, and he smiled, he snickered, and said, that's okay, you don't know who I know. And he was cured of that cancer and lived like another six years, totally fine. 
See, that cha- it, it, he chose to respond in such a way that it changed the, 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 the remaining years of his life. He could have got down, right? He could have got down. I know another guy who's been diagnosed who walks around with a big old smile on his face right here. And he's going to get cancer treatments all the time. And he walks in this church. How you doing? Doing great. Getting another treatment Friday. <laughs> it's awesome. Or he could be, woe is me. I have cancer. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying the way you choose to respond to it sets the tone for the rest of your life. Right? We have the power to decide what to do in response to this stuff. We have immense power in us called choice that's going to determine how much, how long, and simply how this thing, this stuff, is going to affect you and control you. You understand? 10 and 90, 10 and 90. 10% 10% what happens, 90% how you respond. Let me give you an example. Like a temptation comes in a moment, right? Whoop, here comes this pretty girl right here. Used to be addicted. Whoop, here's a little something. Want to try it? Right? Here, here's your taxes. Just, 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 just draw a little different thing there on that line. Withhold a little bit. I mean, the temptation comes in a moment, right? 10%. But the way you respond to it could affect you and the people around you for the rest of your life. Or eternally. We don't understand the power of the choice that we make. And so today I want to start a new series. And I believe completely that if you choose to attend three, four weeks, if you choose to attend weekly, listen to eagerly, that means pen, notebook, attention forward, listening, open ears, open heart, and then act on what you hear faithfully, I believe it can radically shift the trajectory of your life. Amen? So the title of our three- to four-week journey into God's Word is I Choose. I Choose. I didn't make this up. This is based on Scripture. Romans 6.16 says this. This is massively important massively important. For those who have a victim mentality, listen to the word of God. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? Okay? You become a slave. It becomes your master if you choose to obey it. Okay. Now notice in the text, it says whatever we choose, not just whoever we choose. See, when we think of a slave and master relationship, generally speaking, we're going to think of a person-to-person, face-to-face thing, like, a, like an Egyptian taskmaster and then the Israeli slave, right? The, the, in, in our country, it was the same. It was just awful. It was, the, it was the plantation owner and the taskmaster and then the slave, right? It was person-to-person. But notice in the text, it says, whatever we choose, not just whoever we choose. See, it's not always a person that we're choosing to obey. Sometimes it's a thing. See, in my own life, I have made this quite clear to all of you that I was very good at being bad. And I drank, and I smoked like a chimney, and I did it every single day. I thought that's what you did. And I did it really well. I was really bad. I made really bad choices all the time. I was constantly doing this. And when, 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 when listen, when things get stressful, what do you do? Light one up. When, when things get hard, what do you I just need a drink. When things get hard and you don't know what to do, what do you do? Bam. It's just what we do. And these things just kind of own us. It's just our go-to. It's our default. It's what we do, right? Well, I used to do that. And I used to think the same thing. These things own me. But I've now realized that they don't own me. I chose them. And I, listen, I choose them. That's what it is. 
I choose them. See, one day after I became a Christian, now listen, I have the Holy Spirit inside of me now, right? And this little thing right here that used to own me, see, now I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. And, and, and so one day I just said, God, who's now living in me, I'm not praying to some far off ethereal thing, right? It's right here. God, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to drink, and I don't want to smoke. Please take this away. And I'm telling you, loved ones, I made a decision that day to never do it again. And that was over 15 years ago, and I've never had a drink, and I've never had a cigarette. Now listen, I'm nothing. I am nothing. And there are people in this room right now that struggle with things that they think own them. And they can't say no to this dead thing. When the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, and you're going to tell me that this little thing owns you? Please. That's pathetic. That's you not choosing. And I can tell you right now as I'm standing here that you can choose today. God has given you the power right now to choose to never, ever put one of these in your mouth again. Do you agree with me? Okay. So put it where it belongs. Put your heel on its head and say, I own you. You don't own me anymore. And that could change your whole life. Because if you can put down this little pathetic thing, all of a sudden you can start making some real powerful choices to change your life. This is, listen, for those who think this is powerful, I heard today from my loved one that this is a very difficult thing. It was, this is the hardest thing? No. You're fooling yourself. It's nothing. It's nothing. I tell you again, loved ones, it's nothing. And the reason why the church is so weak is because we don't realize that it's nothing and that we can make choices to honor God. And we don't have anyone owning us. We can, we can be powerful people and make choices that are different than the status quo. We can make different choices, okay? So it's not always a person. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's places, oh, the, the strip joint... It, it pulled me in the liquor store. It pulled me in the whatever. The, the, the sports arena pulled me in. Like it, circumstances, philosophies, drugs, booze, smokes, all kinds of different products and the, and the desire to accumulate lots of stuff and comfort and success and family and emotions and feelings and sports and traditions and the list goes on and on and on and on and on of things that are vying to be on your throne running who you are and what you do. But you have the power to choose who or what runs you. You do. You do. I choose. I choose. Someone say, I choose. I choose. I choose. I, listen. I choose. Say it that way. I choose, right? Me. I choose. I choose. This isn't blasphemy. You're going to hear why. I choose because God said whoever you choose to obey becomes your master. He's given you the authority. It's not blasphemy. It's not you saying, look at me, I'm powerful. I no, no, no. He has given you that right. And he has given you that power to choose who you're going to submit to. I choose. Okay? You need to make, start making some good choices. They're going to change the, the atmosphere of, this, of your home, of your relationships, of this church, and this city that we're in. So help us, God. Let's start right here with the first choice. You know, last week, Pastor Jay will be here tomorrow, I think. If, it all depends if it rains. They're off in, in um, Webster doing that uh, Christian Motorcycle Association. They're praying for people, blessing bikes. Keep them in your prayers. But Pastor Jay was here last week, and he was a herald for Jesus. And, and he said, he, he, he announced something that Jesus said in Matthew 6. It's very famous. Very, everyone knows it. He says, you can't serve two masters. That's not Jay's idea. 
That's not my idea. That's the words of Jesus Christ. You cannot serve two masters. Did you ever have a job? Who's had a job? We had two supervisors that were flexing their muscles telling you to do opposite things. How fun is that, right? You're like, eh, eh, I gotta do that. No, don't do that. Do this. He's like, ah, what do I do? What do we do? It's chaos when there's two masters, right? And what you just saw right there, that's y'all. That's me, right? Because I don't have one master. I, have, I don't just have two, <laughs> right? I got a hundred of them. Don't leave me hanging up here, right? All of us, we have a hundred of them. All these different things that are trying to dictate who we are and what to say and what to think and what to do and where to go all the time. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You got to make up your mind, man. It's not a matter of going to a job and having two people tell you what to do. God says in life, you get to choose who's the boss. You're not subject to some boss. They're subject to you. You've got to make up your mind what or who defines you and determines how you're going to live. And, and the reason why you have to make that decision is because this decision, this massive choice, starts to trickle down, right, into every little part of your life. Everything. Every little decision, what you say, how you think, what you do with your resources, what you do with your time, everything, what you buy, what you don't buy, where you go, who you hang out with, what you do, everything is affected by this choice. We all have to decide. And this isn't a new thing. You know, the more things change, right? the culture's change, you're going to be relevant. Well, this is relevant. What Jay said last week is relevant today, right? Can't serve two masters. We know that to be true. And it was true when Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. And you know what? It was true when in, in the book of Joshua 3,400 years ago. It says the exact same thing, but it's the extended version of you can't serve two masters. Joshua 24, verses 14 through 15 says this. Well, you got a Bible? Check it out yourself. I'll read it to you. One of the parts of busting out of the status quo, and while you're turning, let me share this with you. Jay, when he was preaching last week, you know Jay's been preaching for 30-something years, right? Well, he's from the Southern Baptist tradition, and so he's been in Southern Baptist churches for most of his life. And one of the old guys that used to go to church with him, was watching Jay live on our Facebook feed. And, he, and Jay went 45 minutes. And the guy wrote Jay and said, hey, do you need a Timex? I can lend you one. Oh. What? What? He said that Jay also told us that there was a guy one time that came to preach at a church that he was at. And he said, hey, listen, before we start, do me a favor. Take down the clock on the back of the wall and put up a calendar. We might be here a while. <laughs> Praise God. Listen, if there's anything, what's more important than being nourished by the word of God? Is your dinner plans tonight more important than that? If it is, this ain't your church. I love you with all my heart, but it's not your church. All right, this is important, isn't it? Is there anything more important than this? Nothing's more important than this. So why would we limit ourselves and say, well, we've got to be out of here at a certain time. We've got to get out because dinner's ready. I've got to pick up the kids. Gotta, right, well, they'll wait. They'll wait, right? So one of the ways that we're going to bust out of the status quo is I'm not thinking about the time anymore. God's given me a message. I've studied my tail off. I've prayed. I'm ready. I want to share it with you, and I love you enough, and I want to be obedient to him enough to just share this with you. He said, go make disciples of all people, baptize them, and teach them to obey all that I've taught you. Paul preached all night long. The kid fell asleep in the door, in the window frame, fell asleep, died, Paul raised him to new life, and then continued to preach. Come on! we got to get out of here in time because, you know, Starbucks closed, you know, whatever. Okay, so, so listen. Um, this, is what Joshua, this is what it says in Joshua 24. Listen, this is the word of the Lord. So fear the Lord. This is supposed to be just like you can't serve two masters, right? So fear the Lord. And serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever your idols and serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Well, let's, just, let's just examine that for a second, right? 
He says, listen, fear the Lord. We're going to talk about that much. Fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. This isn't about loving him, right? There's nothing about love there. It's serve him wholeheartedly. Give it all, man. Give it all. Give it all. Serve him wholeheartedly, right? Serve him wholeheartedly and put away forever. Put away forever an idol. Idols, anything that stands up and you, um, in opposition to God in your life that you give more resource to? More car payment than offering? More cable bill than offering? More time at a hobby than serving? Whatever it is, right? Whatever it is that stands in opposition and receives your resource of any kind. Not, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about your, any resource that you have available to yourself. What are you giving that freely and mostly to? And he says, put it away forever. Like, don't just let it crawl back, right? If it crawls back, what do you do? Put it away again. Keep putting it away. Don't, don't get lax. Don't get lazy, right? Something crawls off the altar that you gave to God, you put it back. I don't want it. God, get rid of it from me. Away forever. Put away forever your idols, not just a season before where God was the biggest thing in your life and you served him wholeheartedly. And now you're just resting and relaxing and playing golf and fishing till the end. No, he says, this is the words of God to, the, to his people, to serve him wholeheartedly. We're supposed to be measuring our life here. Listen, loved ones. You measure your life against the word of God. You let it bear its weight on you. That's what you're here for. Okay? So he says, serve, you, serve him wholeheartedly, are you? Put away forever your idols and serve the Lord alone. Like just think, just think, loved ones. This is what I'm talking about, having a high bar. Many of you may say, I can't do that, and that would break my heart. But is this not the word of the Lord for his people? He said, serve him wholeheartedly and put away forever your idols and serve the Lord alone. He must be priority one. And I don't want to say what most pastors would say. Priority one. Let's just go one, two, three, four through a hundred. And then 101 starts with your family. Can we start there? Because that's what I'm reading right there. I don't know about you. That's what I see. He says, listen, but if you refuse to do this, if you refuse to serve the Lord. And what is he? How do you serve him? Him alone and wholeheartedly. That means absolute, he's the thing of my life. He's the thing. That's what I give my most and best to all the time. If you won't do that, then choose. There it is. Choose. When? Choose today who you will serve. Not what you did before, not when you walked the aisle 30 years ago. Choose to, like you read, when the Bible, when you read it every day, it reads you every day, right? Choose today who you will serve. Who are you serving today? I, listen, it's not that I don't care, but I don't care what you did at your last church 20 years ago. What are you doing now? Choose today whom you will serve. This is what I'm talking about, about being bold. So I'm like letting the word of God call out to you. Choose today whom you will serve. What are you doing for him? What are you doing for him to, to be that brick in the foundation that Jesus Christ could use to build his church? Or are you coming and consuming? Make up your mind, man. Make up your mind. No more on the fence. No more beating around the bush. No more, well, maybe, kind of, sort of. You know, one of the people that says, Jesus, I'll follow you, he says, hey, listen, can I just... Go say goodbye to my family first? And Jesus is like, no. What? The pastor who preached this said, you got to choose between a divided mind or a non-divisive heart. Which one? Don't go back to your family and think about it and hopefully maybe someday come back and go do this for a little while and think it over. No, no, no. He says, I called you now. When he called his disciples and he said, Matthew, come and follow me, it said he saw him in his tax booth, that's his job, and he left his booth and went and followed immediately. When he went and saw Peter and Andrew and John 
and James, the, fa- the sons of Zebedee, he went, he saw them on the beach. Peter and Andrew were actually fishing while he called them. They were at work, right? That's their provision. That's their profession. He said, come follow me. It said that they immediately followed him. They left their job and said, I'm gone. That's my identity. That's my provision. That's my profession. I'm done. And they went and followed him. And he he said later that same day, he saw two more people down on the beach, John and James, the sons of Zebedee. See, back then they had a more strong bond between kids and fathers, right? Not like mine. They, it was so strong that they, would, they wouldn't say Carl. It was Carl, son of, right? Moses, son of Harvey was my dad's name. That's what it would be, right? It said that they were there in the boat patching the nets with their father, and Jesus said, come follow me, and it says they immediately left their equipment and their father and said, let's go, just like that. Left it all. That's what Jesus wants. No waiting, hoping, beating around the bush, maybe kind of, sort of, someday. No, 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 no. You choose today whom you're going to serve. This is not a tomorrow thing. It's today. We've got to make up our mind. And Jay asked this question. It's so awesome. So awesome, so simple, but so awesome. What's the most important thing in your life? What is the most important thing in your life? Not what you say. Not what you say. Not what you say. See, the Bible would speak this way. It would say that they worship me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. So, so what's the most important thing in your life? And, and we're in church, and many of us would probably say, well, Jesus is the most important thing. But listen, he said some people honor me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. So we have to make a choice, the big choice. What's the big choice? What's the big choice? I'm just going to say, we have to make this choice. I choose Jesus Christ. I choose Jesus Christ. Okay? Now listen, you can still fall victim to honoring, me, honoring him with your lips, but your heart's far away, even if you say that. Right? Remember the, per- the people that come to him and say, hey, I, I prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, we now that did this all in your name. And Jesus is like, who are you? Right? Listen, when you say, I choose Jesus, there's more to it than that. There's some things, uh, I'll just call them like um, sub-choices, secondary choices that you have to make. They're included in this I choose Jesus thing. And all of them are necessary for you to be like really a disciple of Jesus Christ, okay? And so here's the first one, and I've, I've kind of talked a lot about this, but it's worth bringing it back out again because it's massively important, and that is this. To choose Jesus Christ is to choose Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah, okay? Lord and Messiah, What do I mean by that? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This is what it says. So let everyone know for certain, this is for sure, for sure, for sure, that God has made this Jesus to be both Lord and Messiah. Okay? That's what the Word of God says. That Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah. So, so we down with the foolish notion that, that Jesus can be your Lord, but not necessarily your Messiah, right? So, you know, like, I had this buddy. He used to come to this church years ago. He hasn't been here in several years. He's moved. He's gone. He's a thousand miles away. And I used to mess with him all the time. You know, he, he I love the guy. He used to try to tell me that he was a Christian, you know. But he went to this Hindu temple all the time, and he prayed to Vishnu, the elephant, that was what he did, right? But he was trying to convince me that he was a Christian because he kept the rules of Jesus. Because Jesus, even if you don't believe that he's deity, he's a good dude, right? Golden rule, right? You're supposed to be nice to people, right? So you don't, and this guy was a good guy, right? He didn't drink and cuss and lady chase and, and he didn't do all that stuff. He, he kept, he used to say, I keep the golden rule. I'm a Christian, 
It doesn't matter how good you keep the rules, right? right? I get that. That's the lordship. He says you should do this, and, and this guy was doing it. But, but we can't believe that that's good enough, that that cuts it. See, Jesus Christ is not just Lord, and so you're supposed to do what he commands, but he's also Messiah. So there has to be a little bit of this sin-paying forgiveness, right? you got to have that. He's the Messiah. He's the one who paid for your sins on the cross, right? You have to have both of those things, right? And equally foolish is to trust Jesus and his work on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin for eternal salvation, but not follow his commands as Lord of your life. It's not enough. It's not enough. He is both Lord and Messiah. Listen, to choose a lesser Jesus is to choose a Jesus that is not of the Bible, and that Jesus will not help you. It will, that Jesus will not save you. That Jesus will not help you in any way. Choosing Jesus Christ means both choosing him in the day-to-day as Lord as well as trusting him eternally as Messiah. That's what it means to choose Jesus Christ. Okay, so specifically, choosing Jesus as Messiah means that Jesus and Jesus alone and his work on the cross is the singular provision for the forgiveness of your sin so you can go to heaven. Okay, amen? That's it. That's the only way. There's no other way. There's no other way. There's no other deed. There's no other person. Nothing. That's the only way. And for all those good deed doers, that, that's common, right? Are you going to go to heaven? Yeah, I'm a good person. Isaiah 64, 6 says all of our righteous deeds, all our good doing, all the opening the door for old ladies and, and, and buying food for the homeless and, and, and clothing people that are, all that kind of stuff and adopting kids and all that stuff, as far as it pro- making your way into heaven, earning your way, he says all of the righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. He also said in John 10, 9, yes, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. Peter, we can go on forever. I get tons of these. Peter said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. This is a church down the road here in 473, World Mission Society. They baptized people in the name of some Chinese guy. Kwong, some, I don't know what his name was, but like, what? That's a cult. No other name in which we are saved. Paul himself said in Romans 3.22 that we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 said, But now, once for all time, Jesus has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. I choose Jesus as my Messiah. Have you done this? Don't wait another day. Not another day, not another minute. Take down the idols that make you think that you're saved because of that thing and put Jesus on his throne where he belongs. It's the only way. And now I choose Jesus as my Lord. Remember, whatever you choose to obey becomes your master, right? We all have the power to decide. Paul, the Apostle Paul, in Romans, Philippians, and Titus, James in the book of James, Peter in the book of busted second Peter, and Jude in the book of Jude, right? All of them start out their letter by saying, I, Jude, Peter, James, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, a slave of Christ Jesus. Now, in our modern context, that has a bad feeling to it. It smells terrible, right? Slave, slave, right? Nobody likes a slave. It's got a bad thing. But here again, listen, 
Don't think about your feelings about what it feels like, okay? The Word of God has to take precedence, have more weight than what you feel. Yes, it feels bad, but in this context, slavery is not an evil taskmaster that makes you do it. You get to choose that. And these guys chose Jesus Christ as their master. They chose it. They weren't forced. They chose Jesus Christ as master. It means that they stop and they consider who Jesus Christ is and all that this Christ has done for them personally and then responding by choosing to live in radical obedience to his word and his will, that is lordship. I choose Jesus as Lord. And whatever I choose to obey becomes my master. So I choose Jesus as my master. I choose of my own will to bow and obey him, not simply in word, but in deed. Have you done this today? What you did yesterday doesn't count anymore. Have you done this? To choose today, the scripture said, whom you will serve. See, Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. His sheep don't just hear his voice. They actually do what it says. They say, it says, say this, and we say it. Think this way, and we think. Go here, and we go. Don't do that, and we don't. That's what it means. A real Christian is not one who says, I choose Jesus. A real Christian hears his voice and follows him, actively saying yes with your will to Jesus Christ. Is there grace when you fail? Say yes. Yes, yes absolutely. But that doesn't mean you just say, okay, well, then I don't have to. His sheep hear his voice and they follow him. Jesus Christ is both my Lord and my Messiah, okay? That's what choosing Jesus means. Here's the next thing. When we choose Jesus, I choose to be a servant like Jesus, okay? This isn't the pastor trying to impose upon you the necessity for you to come and serve coffee, okay? This is from the scriptures. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. You got a Bible in front of you? Philippians chapter 2, look at verses 3 through 7. Let's just kind of walk through that just a little bit. Um, you there? Yeah. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. I mean, just think about that right there. Just, just think about that for a second. Don't be selfish. That doesn't mean, hey, don't be a jerk. Because a lot of times we equate the two, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't just, don't just think about yourself. Don't just think about yourself. And don't try to impress others. When you try to impress others, what are you doing? You're thinking about yourself because you want them to praise you, right? <laughs> That's what it is. And, and he never said, he, he says this, don't be selfish. Don't be thinking about just you. Don't try to impress so they'll thinking about you and lifting you up. He says, be humble, right? He, said, he didn't say that you weren't, let's just say, he didn't say you weren't awesome. You might be. You might be awesome. Paul, you're awesome. But he's saying, listen, even if you're awesome, let's just, let's just go out on a limb and say, man, Kim, you're just awesome. At least you're just awesome. Right? You come to church today to find out that you're awesome. But he says, but even so, be humble. I mean, you might be just really smart, really nice, really generous, really a lot of things. But he says, but, but, but just be humble. Now, what, a lot of times humble is misunderstood too, like that you have to like, like humble is like, I just, I'm just, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm garbage. But that's not what he says. Humble doesn't mean garbage. In today's vernacular, humble doesn't mean you suck. What does it mean? Thinking of others as better than yourself. Just think of them as more important than you are. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. 
So I love that because in the church, somehow self is in stark contrast with humility. But that's not what God says. You read that. Look what it says. It says, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others as well. So he's not saying wholesale sweeping away of your own desires, like you, that you don't matter anymore. He's like, no, 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 no. Don't just cancel out everything that you like and you want to do. I'm not saying just forget yourself completely. What does he say? Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So both. That's all. Like, it doesn't mean that you're just nothing. You get, you know, the guys who say that the prosperity gospel is bad, so they go to poverty gospel, right? If you're a Christian, especially a pastor, you have to be broke. You have to give every single thing away. You can't live in a nice house. Only we can. And the word of God says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Like, think about the church in, in the book of Acts. People had, had, had resource. They came and sold it so that other people were in need. Does that mean they didn't keep anything for themselves? Well, they'd be starving then. Then those people would have to help. What are they going to do, right? So they shared it. They shared it. And even when Ananias and Sapphira lied about what they gave, what did, what did Peter say? You could have kept it. You could have kept some for yourself. That's not a problem. You just didn't have to lie to God about it, right? You can keep some for yourself. It doesn't mean wholesale disregard for your own life just to help somebody else. He says humble means just not looking out for just yourself. Going back to the verse 3, don't be selfish. Don't, don't show off so that people will think everything about you. It's not just about you. It's not just about you. It's about all of us. We're in community together. Look at verse 5. This is where I get my claim that it's to have the same attitude to serve. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Must. How much wiggle room is there? Okay. Though he was God. So remember a minute ago at least I said you might be awesome, right? Okay. Is God awesome? God's totally awesome, right? Well, look what he says here. Though he was, I don't want to change scripture, but though he was awesome, right? It says though he's God, though he's awesome, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. So he's like, yeah, I'm awesome. I am awesome. But you know what? He says he just emptied himself. So I'm just going to, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty impressive. Jesus could say that, right? I'm pretty impressive. <laughs> I'm pretty good. But you know what? In this case, for the task at hand, I'm just going to give up my divine privileges and take the humble position of a slave. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Lowering yourself down, and caring about other people more than yourself, right? Ephesians chapter 5, I read this last week. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us and gave himself as a sacrifice for us. You see? See how he served us big time? Live a life full of love, following the example of Christ, offering himself as a sacrifice for us. I came to serve, not to be served. So if you're choosing to be a slave to Christ, if you say, I choose Jesus Christ, then that means choosing to consider others above yourself, not, but listen, by serving them greatly. This is not our culture. This is not the world we live in, is it? We can't have wholesale neglect of our own lives and not work. I get that. But what do we spend the most, the majority of our lives doing? Is it, to take, is it taking care of other people or is it taking care of ourselves? I mean, I'm not shunning because, listen, I get it. That's what we do. We spend more time and money on ourselves than anybody else. I remember a while back when we were furnishing, I think it was this church or maybe the one before. I don't remember which one it was. Mama, you might be able to help me, but I had a couple of people call and say, hey, uh, we're getting some new furniture and uh, do you think the church would like our old stuff? And it's like, okay, that, I mean, that's kind of cool, but like, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm crazy. How about, you know, we've been saving up for a while and we want to buy the church new furniture and we'll take the old stuff to my house. 
seems crazy, right? But it kind of lines up, doesn't it? It's like, man, that's kind of what, that's kind of biblical. I don't know if I want to talk about that. Because that's just not the way it is. The way it is is we throw God our scraps. And, 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 and the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo is that that needs to stop. That needs to stop. <clears throat> Choosing Jesus in any authentic way means I willingly lay down my schedule for other people. I willingly lay down my drive to win, my drive to be right, my drive to be powerful, my wants and my desires to be served in the service of other people. In our community coffee house that we've established, we tried to tell anyone who would work there that when someone comes in and asks why we give this thing away, why we're open to you, to the public, when everyone else is charging seven, eight dollars a drink, why are you here in this nice place doing this? Because Jesus came to serve, not to be served. We're supposed to be like him, and this is my way of serving you. That's the radical, momentous, massive shift in the status quo. And so our church is supposed to be developing a different way to live and then bringing that and injecting it into the culture instead of letting that influence us so much. We need to change. We need to change. Okay? Here's the next choice. I don't know. I guess we're long, but whatever. John uh, 10, 22 says, You will be hated by all on account of my name. So when we say we choose Jesus, then we choose right now to be hated. To be hated. John 15, 18 through 19 says, listen, if they hate you, it's because they first hated me. And, and, and they would love you if you belong to this world, but you don't because I called you out. And so therefore the world hates you. They do. In, in Romans chapter 8, he says this great truth. He says, we are God's children. Amen? We are co-heirs with Christ. <laughs> if you share in his suffering. If you share in his suffering, then you will share in his glory. But we want to skip the suffering part. Right? Listen, if, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. Right? They're different. And that life is offensive to some people. And so, no, no, not everyone will hate you. Not everyone will hate you. But if you identify, if you self-identify with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you hold true to his ways, I mean really do what the Bible would say to do, and openly share his word with the world around you, you're going to get pushback across the board. And choosing Jesus means choosing to be okay with that. Okay? There's a, I, just quickly, there's one of my favorite, my second favorite book in the Bible is, is, is a book called Philemon. And it's a story of, of, of here's Paul, right? The, the Apostle Paul he loves Jesus, committed to the mission, all in, awesome guy. We all want to be like him, but, but, but the, he knows this guy, um, Philemon, who's rich and runs a church, right? Christian guy. And they're buddies. But, but Paul got arrested again, and he's in jail. And while he's in jail, he... Someone else gets arrested, this guy Onesimus, right? And he's a, he was a slave to Philemon. What's the coincidence there, right? The chances of this happening, not only does it happen, but he gets put in the jail cell with Paul. So what do you think is going to happen? He's getting saved, right? No doubt, right? Guys get saved, right? So, so we're talking about like losing, like be willing to be hated. So, so, so Paul is friends with, with Philemon, and he's friends now with Onesimus, right? Brothers in Christ. And he says, listen, Philemon writes him a letter. He says, listen, this dude that's, that, that was your slave and stole from you, I want you to treat him like you would if I came to your house. Receive him back as a brother. Man, Right? So what I'm saying is, is that Paul, he understands, I'm sure, as you would, the tension that's there and the potential of losing Philemon as a friend. Oh, you want me to bring this guy back into my house and put him up in a guest room like you were coming? He stole from me, dude. Right? 
That could happen. But Paul said, I'm willing. I'm willing to lose you as a friend to be obedient to Christ. And we have to be willing to lose friends and family and reputation and all of that to be a true, authentic Christ follower. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Our lives, like transform lives. I'm talking about living for Jesus. Really living for Jesus, right? Letting it show. He's the priority all the time. Choosing today who you'll serve. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. And so God, do you ever see that? I'm a big wrestling fan. You remember The Rock? And he's standing and goes, right? Yeah. So I can just imagine God's up there going, when we, when we truly act the way we should, he's going, finally, right? <laughs> And so when we act the right way, when we actually open the Bible, read what it says, and do it, that's like a fragrance rising up into the nostrils of God. It makes them happy, right? But not everybody feels that way about it. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 15 through 16, that this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and those who are perishing, those who are not going to be saved. He says, to those that are, that are being saved, it's a life-giving perfume. Look at it. You ready? <sighs> Smells like Don's jerky. <sighs> right? <laughs> but listen, to those who are perishing, that same <sighs> is a dreadful smell of death and doom. You need to be willing to be hated. And when the scripture says that you need to love him, he said you need to love me more than your mom, more than your dad, more than your kids. You love them, right? You love that little baby like crazy, I'm sure. And Jesus said, you, no, no, no. You want to be my follower? You want to be worthy of my kingdom? You need to love me more than that. And so you need to be willing to put yourself out there and say, you know what? I choose to be hated, and that's okay. People hated Jesus. And if you truly serve him in any authentic way, then people, they're going to hate you too. And you need to be okay with that. To worship and honor me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me, is very common. Jesus said that the gate is narrow and that the road is difficult. And he said you need to count the cost. And many people have come to the altar and said, I choose Jesus, but they have not chosen what I just described to you. And loved ones, that's why the church in America is plummeting. That's why the morality in America is tanking. Because the institution that God has put in place and established and, and ordained to be these people, to push that darkness back, we're weak. Because that's not the life that we live. And that's the life that I'm calling you to here tonight. And that's the life that God's word is calling to you tonight. Set the bar high. And some of you might not be able to receive this and say, that's just too much. I can't do that. I love you, and I pray that you'll receive it. But heaven forbid I set a lower bar than what you just heard and deceive you into thinking you're saved. I don't want that. So it's a tough message, right? An all-in message, I get it. But that's what the word, do you guys all agree that that's what the word of God has said? Okay, awesome. So, all in, all people, all in, all the time. That's what the church really is. Everyone involved in something. Everyone giving of themselves to serve the body of Christ, to reach the lost, to build the kingdom of God as our number one priority. 
and nothing is a close second anymore. I want, I want when people walk into this church, they step foot into a culture of excellence and service that they've never seen before. When they walk in, they feel like, man, I need to serve because everyone is. That's just what we are because Jesus Christ came to serve, not to be served. So that needs to be a shift in the status quo of our church. And so tangible, practical things. He said, if you put your hand to the plow and turn back, you're not fit for the kingdom. So I'm literally, this is what I think church is supposed to be. I, 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 since day one, he said, this is what I want you to do. And I've backed off and backed off and backed off because people tell me you shouldn't do it this way, you shouldn't do it that way. But when they mean well, I get it. But the model in America of the way church is supposed to run and the way pastors are supposed to act, it's dying. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm done taking that advice. Okay? Because 15 years ago, in my spare bedroom, my God spoke to me and said, do this. And I'm not going to apologize for that anymore. So you may think that this is wrong, but I love you enough to do it anyway. Before you leave tonight, put your hand to the plow and make a decision. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be a greeter. You're going to help Paul and the team with audio video. You're going to help Mike clean this joint. You're going to help Marty prepare gift bags. You're going to tell Karen that you want to be a greeter. You're going to tell Meredith that you're going to work once or twice a month with the children and help them know and love Jesus. Something. Everyone in the church. Everyone in the church. Not just a Moses speech. Everyone in the church. Okay? Make a decision that you're going to serve him wholeheartedly and serve him alone. That's what the Bible says, right? So I would just encourage you to to, to open it, read it, and do it. Listen, loved ones, that's where blessing is. That's where blessing is, in obedience to his word. And I want you to be blessed, and I want us to be blessed, and I want our city to be blessed, and I want our city and our world to be different because Revolution Church was here. We don't need another little church in the corner. We need a powerful church that leaves a big footprint on this city. Amen? All right. Plug into something. I want someone to talk to me tonight about what they can do. Serve in the coffee house. Help out, whatever. Light me up with something. Light Meredith up. Light Karen up. When you see Marty tomorrow, tell her you want to help. Tell Mike you want to help clean. Do something. Just do something. Just do something. He's placed us together perfectly. And as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. And then the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. That's what we want, right? And that's what you got to do to get it. Father, I thank you for this time together tonight. I know, Lord, that sometimes um, a biblical church is going to have uh, a ministry like Jesus where people um, wander off because it's too difficult to receive. And I can understand, Lord, that there may be people right here right now that are going, man, that's just too much. I can't do it. I can't do it. God, help them. Help them. Help them with short-sightedness. Help them to realize that the the life that they have pales in comparison to the life that they could have if they did what your word said. Please release blessing and favor upon those who are obedient to your word. Just please bless them like crazy. Now, Lord, we're going to do this offering thing. And here, this is hard to. But here we are, Lord. Here we are. And here we are. Rubber meets the road. What's most important? Me? Me? or others. Me or others. So Lord, I could beat around the bush and we could put a mask on our offering, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. Me or others. Loved ones, I'd ask you to take a few moments before any basket goes around this room or before you approach a box or whatever. 
that you would just simply ask the Lord what serving him financially would be for the good of others. Just ask him. Because serving him alone wholeheartedly for Matt might be a little different than it is for me, right? Everybody's different. He's got us all. We're all here. And we're trying to build the church. We're trying to build the kingdom. He said, I will build my church. And he's building it on us. So if we want a second and third floor, you've got to have a solid first. So I ask him how your first floor brick, what it would look like. And then these guys are going to come through the room and you can give accordingly. That's all I would ask is you to please pray that and follow the Spirit's leading in the way that you'll give. And we'll give you about two minutes or so and then the guys will come through the room.